Welcome to Not So Standard Deviations. This is episode 103, and I'm Roger Peng from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, and I'm here with Hilary Parker of Stitch Fix. In this episode, we're talking about forecasting the primaries from 538. Uh, we're talking about time series analysis, R package management, artificial intelligence, and the Hilary Parker job requirement. What should we talk about? Like, I'm so not thinking about data science right now. <laughs> Yeah, I know who is right. <laughs> I know, yeah, and like, and yeah, I can't speak authoritatively about the COVID stuff at all. Yeah, I've got nothing. I, I, I have no expertise in this area whatsoever. Yeah, and it sounds like there's not anything interesting going. I was like, oh, Roger will be able to talk about what's happening at Hopkins, and like, nope. Never mind. Well, <laughs> yeah, the only interesting thing that's happened is that we've canceled all our classes. Not canceled. We've uh, moved all the classes yeah. online. That's intense. I mean, this is like a pretty big transition for everyone. Yeah. It's, well, the most, the trickiest thing, honestly, is that, like, so next, it, today's Wednesday as we record. Next mm -hmm. week is spring break. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But classes are already, like, canceled starting today. So there's today, mm -hmm. Thursday, and Friday, where the term is still, there's three days left in the term, basically. But we can't meet in person. So, but, like, usually those last three days is when you have, like, final exams, you know? And uh, so I don't know, like, I'm not teaching this term, so I don't know what's happening, but um, but it must be, it's just a mess, yeah, so. Yeah, like, yeah, doing a remote exam is like. I don't know how that works, yeah. High level, yeah, like, that's, that's like high level remote teaching versus doing lectures online. It's like, okay, I set up a streaming, whatever, you know, that seems easy versus teaching or doing an exam remotely is like there's got to be some technology involved yeah and they, like, they have it because we have remote exams all the time but i just like if you're teaching like a 200 person class and you're expecting to do the re exam in person you know uh just converting that over is a is a chore yeah that would be stressful i would be very stressed about that yeah like i feel glad like i this could not be easier for me like i'd set up a home office i have a remote friendly job and I have, you know, I have all the resources like available to me in terms of like delivery and, you know, it's just like, I don't have kids. So it's just like, oh, okay. Like I work remotely once a week, I guess now it's like every day. <laughs> and so it, like, yeah, that's been super simple. And then when I see people on Twitter, like who teach and stuff, I'm just like, whew, so glad that's not me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing that's been hard, and this is so, like, I'm not complaining, is just the physical demand of sitting in the same chair is much higher. I mean, I actually, there's a re I so I do these one-day sits, like, meditations, and was aware of how physically trashed you are at the end of the day from those. Um, and then I have my alien chair thing where I'm sitting cross-legged. Like, I'm essentially sitting in the same posture as I do when I meditate. Um, which, again, like, to me, that's much easier than sitting in, like, an office chair. So, like, fine with that. But I've just been the same level of physically trashed at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> of, like, I was like, oh, my gosh. The fact that at work I, like, walk around and I'm sitting in different chairs from time to time, like, really makes a difference versus... Now I'm having meetings all day, but I'm just like, you know, Not sitting moving. upright. Yeah. And, and like the meetings are just going completely back to back because like you'll be in a meeting the way we use blue jeans and like you'll be in a meeting and the next people like show up in the call when they're ready for the next meeting. Oh, okay, and so yeah. then, yeah, like, and the office culture used to be like everyone's a few minutes late. So like that's when people like run to the bathroom or just like walk from meeting to meeting. Whereas now people are showing people are still going late, but then they're showing up in time to the next one. So there's just like no pauses yet. <laughs> um, and then I just had a meet, like very meeting heavy week. So I've just been like it's yeah, it's it's been physically demanding in a way I didn't expect. So that's been my biggest transition so far. Yeah. I never, I, I never realized like how much, like it's how much kind of, I guess, energy is not energy. It actually makes a difference. Like going to and from the meeting is actually like an, a, like a, a, a kind of non-trivial amount of like getting up and going somewhere. And it's just for me, like I like, often I have to go across the street to medical school or something like that. And, um, yeah. and that, so that amount of movement, it really makes a difference though. Because, like, if you didn't have to do that and I just, like, sat in my, and I just sit in my chair all day, then I'm missing out on a lot, I think. 
Yeah, absolutely. I Yes, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, we have, like, a lot of stair. Like, you know, we have six floors in an office building. And so going from floor to floor is, like, you know, kind of a lot. Yeah. And it's, like... Again, this is something you can simulate at home, but, like, we just haven't established the, like, cultural norms around the cadence. You know, it's like, okay, like, let me go and walk up and down the stairs to the second floor of my apartment for, like, like go up, down, up, down as, like, exercise between these meetings. Or, right, yeah. You know, stretch. But, again, and even when I do the one-day sits, that's built in as, like, a meditation where you, like, do 25 minutes and then you, like, do a 10-minute, like walking meditation and then you like you know monks figured this out in like 1200 (laughs) (laughs) that like you can't sit straight for so many hours so it's just something to learn but that's such a small again i'm not complaining because it's like oh that's easy to figure out but yeah it's just intellectually interesting i guess (laughs) maybe we could do people a favor by not by talking about something else (laughs) yeah yeah what else is there to talk about there's nothing else to talk about really (laughs) i know i know i just actually you know the we can talk about politics no no no, no. we're not going there (laughs) well i i did want to comment briefly that i think the um the uh primaries forecaster that 538 came up with was i think it like delivered like i think it was pretty helpful what do you mean by that? So I'm not really keeping track. So if you could just explain. Yeah. So we were talking earlier. We talked like at various points about like, I think 538 is coming out with this forecast predictor. Right. So it's like essentially like a mammoth model trying to predict who wins the primary um, that updates after each like poll and each um, primary to like update the probabilities of various candidates winning um, the primary. And it really, like, I mean, it's hard to know because it's a forecast, right? And it's forecasting something that you only observe once. So, and the probabilities, like, varied wildly in this uh, forecast. So, like, you can't exactly validate, like, yes, it was right at that point, And then it was right later on. But it did intuitively track what, like pundits were saying or what seemed to be happening pretty well um where it was like you know sanders was up biden was down and then biden shot back up and now biden's probability of winning um like all the the delegates necessary to secure the nomination without a contested convention is like over 99 percent now okay and so and but and sanders went down to like less than one percent so that and that seems to be like what has happened and so that's just sort of interesting in terms of that was such an ambitious project and it really like made my stomach turn to even think about like trying to do that but i think they did a pretty good job like i was impressed with it well it seems also i guess because it could adapt right it did, yeah exactly i just mean that like it's not like they made a call six months ago and then and just waited mm-hmm. right Uh, I mean, so yeah, like they empirically modeled like in the past, we've seen this happen after the, you know, Nevada caucuses or, you know, this happened. Um, And like the they was it Clyburn, right? The guy from South Carolina um, who endorsed Biden right before their their primary. They they weighted like endorsements at various moments, and his was like the highest weight one. And that is again, it seems like that's how it played out. That his endorsement of Biden was fairly impactful. Like I thought that they did a good job. And the only thing that I wish had been reflected in the model a little better was uh, like the uncertainty. Um, but I'm not. I'm also not sure how you would reflect that well. I mean, I guess you could just put, like, you know, confidence intervals, or I guess he was doing, like, Bayesian stuff, so whatever. Prediction intervals? I can't remember. Credible what. intervals or whatever. Credible intervals, yeah. But, I don't know, that might have been a lot to absorb uh, glancing at it, so. Although, I don't know. Yeah, they, they kind of in- implied that from, they visually represented it as, like, a timeline. So, it was very clear that it's like, oh, yeah, there's still a big chunk <laughs> between where we are right now and where, you know, the convention is. 
and you could visually see the lines bouncing around. Right. So in that sense, there was a lot of uncertainty represented. And then in some ways showing uncertainty, that makes sense for like a model that doesn't have a lot of state changes, you know? Whereas yeah. this had tons of state changes. Right, so, yeah. And state, not meaning like U.S. state, but just like literally. Like, like states the, of the system. Yeah, like data generation model changes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like dramatically. So, And it was interesting because they have a podcast where they, like they, the subset of their politics podcast called Model Talk. And they kind of answered people's questions. And a lot of people were writing in like, why did this vary so much? And it's like, because it did in the world. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like I, I get the need for like, hey, if this is swinging around wildly, is it helpful? And it's like, well, kind of like. It's just empirically representing the moment, yeah. But that's, I mean, there's an element of where, like, that is, there is a modeling choice to be made, though, especially for this kind of a model where, you know, things are evolving over time, is the question is whether that variability, is it noise or is it, like, system variability, you know? And uh, and that is a bit of a modeling choice, I think, um, because uh, it's not like it's identifiable in the model, necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, the way they visually represented that was, like, little kind of, like, lines for like this primary is at this state and that one's at this date so you could kind of i think they they kind of assume that readers would understand that there were state changes in the model and this was like visually identifying when they would happen right to some degree yeah, okay um, yeah 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 so like in that sense it they i feel like they maybe they could have put more disclaimers of like to be clear this will not be a straight line you know <laughs> this is like i think they just kind of assume people would know that but then the questions reflected that maybe people weren't totally wrapping their head around that right. or something yeah. yeah i i guess like closing the loop on that discussion like you know they took on a pretty ambitious thing and i think like it paid off you know Pretty well. Like, I was tracking it pretty closely. Yeah. Um, other people were tracking the betting markets, and I think the model did a better job than the betting markets. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. that's cool. That's usually the case, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's a big debate, apparently. Okay. Like, you can tell it's a sore spot for Nate Silver. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> he's, he's someone whose sore spots are, like, on display a lot. I, yeah. It's <laughs> he's a, opinionated. It's so funny the different. I listen to a couple of political podcasts and like you really do learn people's personalities from podcasts. Like the kind of like vibe of the five thirty eight office. There's like a little bit more snark or like I don't yeah. know. It's just a little bit of a different vibe than like this like talking points memo. This kind of like liberal politics podcast I listen to, and that's that's much more like erudite. Like it's a history PhD. Um, and a little bit more like self-deprecating. I don't know, just like a, a different vibe than the other one. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's just interesting. So you know, I actually I have a topic that's marginally related to the uh, sure. primaries forecaster. I just so this in the third term, which just ended like well, it's about to end this week. Um, I taught a I taught a new course actually oh. on uh, time. Do you tell it's on time series analysis. Oh, cool. That's your specialty, right? Well, not exactly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Like, there's many parts of time series analysis that I'd never do. And so yeah. I actually did. Ha I actually had to, like, learn a lot <laughs> like, <laughs> in order to teach this class. Um, but cool. I only mentioned it because, first of all, what well, you were talking about, you know, this forecasting system. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, second of all, like, it's it, I, this class was very different for me because it, like the other classes I teach one is like uh, like computing in R and mm -hmm. the other one is data science mm -hmm. and like this uh, the, but the, so comparative compared to those other two topics time series analysis is like ancient history you know yeah I was gonna say this is like real real traditional it's real <laughs> classical yeah and I have to say it was like very refreshing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, I can totally see can that you, really okay yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it's like you're not I, – I, let me tell you what popped in my head thinking about that. We have like – right now there's sort of an interesting vibe on in, at Citrix and on the company – on the team I work on because we have like fixes and, you know, we call it the match score, but it's essentially like the probability that you would buy an item, you know. And that's like – 
what we've been doing for like seven, eight years. I can't, I never can remember a long time, right? Like that's like the core product, the thing we've been working on, very established pipeline. We like iterate on the model. And then there's like this new kind of like, um, we call it like direct buy, like the um, shop your looks outfits and things. And that's like the wild west, you know, where we're just like pulling together models and it's like early days. So it's like more startup ish. And like, it's just completely different lines of work. Like those are like drastically different. And so to me, it seems sort of like that, where it's like, like teaching data science is like the wild west <laughs> whereas like time series analysis like you've been doing it forever like like you, like the community and also you personally and so there's like much more established methods and like teaching it probably is something that you're iterating on rather than like oh man i have to think from scratch about what to do is that what you mean which 100 what i mean <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and like and even <laughs> just going beyond that like if I have a question about what to do, I literally have seven textbooks sitting on my desk that have different variations of the answer. And so, like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, nice. how yeah. much, like, I could draw on, like, an almost infinite history of other people's work. Whereas, like, I, when I teach data science, I'm like, what, what am I doing? And then, like, the next, <laughs> the next year, it's like, we're doing something totally different now. <laughs> you yeah, know? totally, totally. <laughs> and uh, it, anyway, so I haven't, because I haven't, like, I used to teach the, like, regression modeling class, which is obviously, like, the most classical of all things. But that's, it's been many, it's been almost, like, almost 10 years since I taught that class. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've been mostly teaching like kind of current, what you might call current topics. And mm -hmm. it just, it was nice to like go back to a classical topic and just like not have to worry about like, you know, reinventing the wheel every five minutes, you know. And the students get it. So it's just like, everyone's just, it's like your comfort zone. Everyone's expectations are just met, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not, I, I definitely, there are times, I mean, everyone has those times of like, you long for the familiar. I guess that's true. I guess I didn't realize how much difference it would make. But I have to say, it's pretty cool. And so one thing I did this time around, I don't this is like, I don't know, this is, <laughs> this is like course strategies now. But, you know, normally, in the past, I would write up my notes like just on paper, right? Um, but I wrote, I decided this time I'm going to join like the 20th century and, <laughs> um, and write, write up my notes on the computer using Bookdown. Oh, interesting. So, so yeah. basically, I kind of started a book, and like every chapter it was a, roughly speaking a lecture. So there was like eight weeks. There's eight chapters. Um, wow. And uh, and now I have like a book down book on time series analysis. That's pretty cool. That's a good idea. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. cool actually. Are you gonna put it like throw it up on a uh, lean pub? Uh, I think yeah. I'd say it's probably seventy percent of a like an actual book right now. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. it needs another twenty, and then I could probably put it up on Leap. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna do that? Yeah. Why not? I mean. Yeah, that's cool. Cost me nothing, basically. Yeah, that's a, that sounds cool. I like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a cool topic. I recommend. Uh, <laughs> I recommend teaching a class on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's an area of statistics that I just completely shied away from. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't. I don't know why. I mean, I. I I've like dipped my toes in it before, but I, yeah, for whatever reason, it's not like I, I, I connect more with a like survival analysis, which is a little bit of a time series esque. Really? Problem. Wow, that's like the exact opposite for me. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Well, time uh, survival analysis is also it's like helpful for my field. You sure, know, yeah. like it's an it's a one way of addressing i mean yeah we're doing experiments where we're looking for certain outcomes and people are allocated to the experiment at different times so it like is appropriate for mm -hmm. <laughs> what we do but also i don't know yeah to me i i kind of like that paradigm i guess it's just probably if i was working on time series stuff i'd be like i love time series but i'm just not so yeah <laughs> i don't have experience there one thing i didn't realize before i kind of started off on this was uh on this course is that like there is actually quite a there's like a pretty strong connection actually i have a fun fact for you so there's a pretty strong connection between like some sub areas of time series analysis and particular state-based modeling um and and like space and rockets. Oh, okay. So Same. like, so like, two of my kind of interests kind of overlapped for a period there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. 
Did you actually use that in the class? Uh, yes, I think. Yeah. So I did. There were like a lot of public health examples in this class, which probably is like an area for improvement. Um, but there were quite a few rocket examples. Yeah. <laughs> were the students like into it? They're I don't. They're fine. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like so uninterested in rockets. I yeah. I don't. Know. What What do you like about them? Like, what's the appeal? Um, that's a good question. I guess you know what it is. Here, I'll tell you what it is. Like, if you dig deep. Mm-hmm. Like I was never very good at physics. Uh-huh. And I think this is like a thing that allows me to like think about physics in a way that I can kind of understand a little bit because it's like a physical th- it's like an actual thing there. Yeah, it's just, like very Newtonian physics. Yeah, it's cl- it's totally classical, right? And so Yeah. I I think it's like rekindled my interest in that area of science which I was never really good at. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay, I can see that. But uh, the fun fact I have for you is that there's like this technique in in time series analysis called Kalman filtering, mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't know this, but it was actually invented here in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So there used to be so there was this uh, company called the Martin Aerospace Company, uh, which eventually mm. became Lockheed Martin. Oh, okay. And they used to have like a research institute here that was like associated with the aerospace company. Like a pure, you know, like Microsoft Research or like Bell Labs, you know, that kind of a thing, right? Oh, okay, yeah. And it was here in Baltimore. And like, so they would have like just pure like mathematicians just like thinking up stuff. Doing rocket science. Uh, Doing like, you know, like guidance, mostly airplane stuff. So like guidance algorithms and stuff like that. And uh, and Rudolf Kalman was one of those people. So there you go. There you go. That's cool. Fun fact. I I think I I have like a deep discomfort with space, you know. Okay. <laughs> that I, it's like a thing. I like same with oceans. I like vast unknowns. You know. It gives you what does it do to you? It, I have like a visceral gut scared feeling about it. Like it's it's hard to explain, but like even if I am scrolling over like Google Maps and I go over the ocean, I like get scared. I could see no, I could see that. And, like, every once in a while, like, there's some places on Google Maps where you can see, like, shipwrecks, essentially. Oh, yes. And that is, like, oh, my God. I hate that. Like, it's, like, sh- I like clo- it's like a horror movie. I, like, close my eyes and, like, peek out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so how are you on boats? You don't like boats? I don't, That's the thing. I'm actually I, – I don't love boats. Like, I, I'm not, like, take me to the sea, you know. Although it doesn't come up as much when I'm on boats. But I also – don't go on boats like barely at all so i don't have but i've been on ferries that go across like the um lake michigan from like michigan to wisconsin yeah um and like it's not horrible for me it's i don't know it's more thinking about like being underwater like where the like sea monsters that's not your thing um yeah it's and it's probably honestly more i mean obviously it's psychological but it's like it's more like the concept than it is like facing the actual reality you right know? yeah like looking at the monster under the bed is not as scary as thinking, like, it, thinking right. about them yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then um yeah with space it's the same way like i have very little interest like i i do not like thinking about the universe so okay yeah. i can see that so that's probably like a gut instinct reaction to rockets yeah did you see that guy with like his homemade rocket like exploding oh yeah or just like crashing yeah yeah the, yeah, he, the, yeah the guy who died yeah yeah i did read that story yeah but that was you didn't did you watch the video I did, no i did not watch the video yeah <laughs> i mean it's not it's not like that i mean people are like oh you know it's graphic but it's like you'll see like a rocket go up and come down <laughs> like there's not like that right. much to yeah. it and but... i didn't watch it i just i just heard about it yeah 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 but... it's a dangerous business that's for sure that's i have zero just zero interest in it but Kudos to people who do. You know. <laughs> I have another uh, story. Well, so I have another story of me joining the 20th century. Oh, okay. What's that? Actually, this might be 21st century. So this is like, I, I, I mentioned this on Twitter about how I use the cloud. Uh, this is my... Yeah. Yeah. This is like an R packet. You were like submitting to CRAN or something. Yeah. So I have this, pa- I think I may have talked about this in the past. I can't remember. I have this package. It's called GPC lib. And mm-hmm. I literally wrote the package in 2002. Wow, oh my uh, God. and it require and the, so the none of that is remarkable except for the fact that it required me to write to like write C code because there was basically the long story is like there's a C library 
that I wanted to use in R, but there was no package that linked to it at the time. So I wrote the R package that kind of incorporated the C library, um, and I had to write some like, you know, C connector code, et cetera, and uh, and so that you could use it in R. Basically, that's like. So anyway, no big deal, right? And that was first of all, that was back when I like remembered how to program in C, right? So, um, fast forward uh, eighteen years, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm getting like emails from Kurt Hornick on CRAN that's like, this package is going to be taken off CRAN because it gets all these warnings, right? Uh. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and you know, now they're like, they're a little bit, you know, they're a little bit more like hard nosed about it. Like they give you a hard deadline. You know, it's like, you have to do it by this date. And um, all right, so I'm going, to, so one thing I have to say that, I, like the one thing that R, that kind of like really, really won me over to the, to our studio. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about the company. I'm talking about like the IDE, like the interface part is uh, the package development cycle, right? So like the one thing that the IDE really changes for the better, and there's no substitute really, I think is the, how it main, how you manage the package development cycle. And, uh, and also like the checking, like how that's all integrated. Uh, so I think it's, that, that's all amazing. But the problem is like, if you have C code or any sort of compiled code in your package, there's like, there's not much that RStudio can do to help you with that. Right. And and the biggest problem with now, which I don't think happened in the past, or maybe it did, I don't know, but is that like in order to it's like it can be very it can be hard to replicate the warnings that CRAN gets on your compiled code if if you don't have the identical setup that they have. Right. I see. And so and they don't test their their software on Macs. And so like I would check my package on my like my Mac and no warnings, right? But that's because I use a different C compiler than they do, uh, which is like the Mac default, you know, C compiler. Um, and so I had to like hunt around for a platform somewhere that was close enough to what they use on CRAN to see if I could replicate the warning. So I'm like, okay, the, the, we, our cluster, you know, uses a Linux system. So I'll go to the, like, the cluster and like try to build a package there and see if I could generate the warning. No luck. <laughs> so it, I think it was like a different version of the GCC compiler that they have in the cluster. So it wasn't generating the warning. Oh, uh, no. So I'm like, okay, I need to like find another system that is yeah. close enough. So I'm like, okay, I heard about this cloud thing. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't just go and like buy a computer. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> don't joke about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I feel like that's what you would have yeah. done. I could have built my own cloud, right? Your private cloud. Yeah. I feel like that's what you see. I've seen like professors with like their own little stacks, you know, in their office. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so anyway, I went up to fire up a, like an instance, and the first one I did was not didn't also didn't work. It was like I think it was the wrong version of Linux. Mm -hmm. This was AWS or something. I used so I used DigitalOcean. I just find it easier to use. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. So then I had to like get another operating system, and then I could get it to work. So then I was able to mm -hmm. generate the warning and. Uh, and then I had to like figure out how to edit the C code to get the warning, get rid of the warning, right? Which was a whole other kind of thing. I was gonna say you said you got down four rabbit holes, I think, on Twitter. Yeah, well, you kind of like live tweeted the experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, at first I was like, okay, maybe I can install the compiler. So like the Mac has uses a compiler called Clang, and um, they use GCC on CRAN. So I was like, well, what if I just install GCC on my computer? And, and then see if I can generate the warning. So I tried that, and I, for whatever reason, couldn't generate the warning. So, like, I don't know. must have, like, missed some sort of flag or something like that, right? Uh, so that was, like, attempt number one, basically. Uh, and then I had to – and then I've come, like, going down, finding different systems. And then, and then and there was, like – basically, there was, like, a cross – it was like a cross section of like compilers and operating systems that I had to like match up. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Wait, but yeah, I guess what, what like um, the R core could do, or like, I don't know, the cram people, whoever, what subset of R core is doing that could like, what do they like publish specs about their system so that you can replicate it or? I could not find that anywhere. And because there's two things one is like the system that they use. Uh, like the OS, right? The other is the compiler that they use. Right. And then the last is the compiler flags that they use. Right. Oh, I see. So and Also, you kind of need, like, there's, like, environment variables that you might need, too. I feel like this is something, and I, I have, like, like, only abstractly at best can describe this, but, like, couldn't they have some sort of, like, 
Docker container that you replicate, or I don't know, like something where you like clone some sort of instance that is their instance, and it like ports all that over. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that. I think the issue with all of this is that it would have to be maintained. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what. Yeah. It's not. I don't want to like hand them more work, but it that, that would be like the ideal solution, I assume. Right. I mean, even a web page that detailed the options that they use would have to be maintained. Right. And so yeah, right. I, I'm guessing that they don't want yet another thing to maintain. So, yeah, but someone should do that, man. That would be a service. Although I guess, though, in this case, you're using like a very specific compiler situation that most people don't. Right. Well, I think this doesn't affect most people because most people don't have any compiled code in their package at all. Yeah. Or if you use like RCPP, do you need did you run into this problem or no? I think less, my guess is less so. I've never used RCPP, but my guess is less so. Mm -hmm. And even if you yeah. did, probably Dirk Edelbutel would take care of it for you. <laughs> 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 like, if it was an issue with RCPP, like, per se, like, that would be handled. I right, think. right, yeah. Uh, if it's an issue with your code, then you're still out of luck, but... Um, did it feel worth it? Like, are you ha do you have any users do you have on your package? Well, not as many as there used to be. So this package used to be, like, the only one of its kind. And um, but since you know 2002, uh, many a number of packages have replicated the functionality. Actually, you know the uh, interesting thing about this package, I think if I submitted it to Cran today, it would be rejected um, because it's like other things do this. Well, no, also because it doesn't have a, it doesn't actually have a free software license. Oh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> so the library that I'm using has like a very vague license, but basically it's you can use it for academic purposes, but not for commercial purposes. So interesting. Back in 2002, I think they weren't really like cracking down on that kind of stuff, um, and so they let it on CRAN. But that's technically that's not a free software. That's not an open source license if you restrict it for commercial use. So anyway, so I think like it's on, still on CRAN just because it probably got grandfathered in. But I think if I submitted it new today, it wouldn't even be allowed. So most they used to have a lot of reverse depends, but now it only has like five packages that depend on it. Well. Are you happy you spent your time that way? Like this week or last week, whenever it was? You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whatever. It was fine. Um, yeah. I think at the end of the day, like, I don't need this package to be on CRAN. I, I would prefer to not have it on, I think. Um, but I, I, I don't want to just take it off just because. Because uh, that would disrupt other people, too. Um and so I was like, it was literally like the last day of the deadline. And I was already weak. They gave me an extra week, right? So <laughs> it was the very last day. I'm like, am I going to just like pull this thing off CRAN or am I going to fix it, right? And so I assume you want to, if you pull it, you'd want it to be like a, like intentional where it's like, okay, I've decided to retire this. Let me communicate out to people, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, yeah, that's what you should do, right? That's responsible. Yeah. I it did have um, one package that just like died a horrible, miserable death on CRAN. And, and they were like, we can't keep this on there. And I'm just like, all right, just take it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't even put up a fight. Did you get any flack? No, no, because no, that was a package that nobody depended on. And, and frankly, nobody used, so. Yeah, so it's just like, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like I just always feel so much more in control if I do it intentionally versus having it kind of happen. It feels better, obviously. You feel more in control if it's like, okay, I've decided, like, I looked at the work I have to do in this one. I feel like I just want to sever the ties. And, like, it's not like Cran told me to pull it. Um, but realistically, I'm sure that Cran pulling it is, like, 99% of packages that go away. That's why. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the deprecation life cycle. I mean, this is something that companies handle better, right? Where it's like, okay, it's part of someone's job to like have a deprecation right. process. Yeah. Well, this is an area where you need, rather than have personal memory, you need like institutional memory, right? And I think the problem is my personal memory is like, of, especially my personal memory of C programming is fading, right? But that would never happen at a company because hopefully you would have like institutional memory, right? And then you make a strategic decision if you're like, okay, we no longer want people to have to like know this or like learn this. It's not worth our time. Right. So, yeah. yeah. But, I, but yeah. there are like companies out there that maintain software, you know, like that it's written in COBOL or whatever, you know? And, uh, oh, for sure. So yeah. It's just like, no. yeah. But no individual person, I think, could really do that. That's just like, yeah, the curse of open source. <laughs> like, Once again. Yeah. <laughs> 
crazy to do it. But you know, basically. I think on a, the, a brighter note, though, I do. It does make me feel better. I, I, this sounds weird, but it makes me feel better that I, that I don't really think the package is necessary at all. You know. Yeah. So this is like kind of more of a fun hobby. You mean? No, I just because like other people have created the functionality. You know, in a in frankly a better way that's fully open source. You know, it's like I think like this package was na- needed at a time when there was nothing, right? And so the fact that it's no longer needed means that because like that gap has been filled. Uh, and so I'm happy. Like I would be happy to just like archive it or whatever. But you know, I won this battle, so it'll be on for another year or so. Well, at this point, it's like, are you being? Are you propping up dysfunction in other people? Like, is this codependent? Where it's like, <laughs> you would do people more good by, like, severing the tie <laughs> so that they move to more updated software, you know? Uh, well, I, I don't know. It's not like there's anything wrong with this package, right? It's not like they're using a, a clearly inferior, you know, <laughs> package. Yeah, uh, so that's fair. But, that's uh, fair. <laughs> It is. A, I have a clearly inferior, inferior maintainer, though. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Like, you put a lot of effort into this, so that doesn't seem terrible. Like, it, I don't know. Uh, actually, I actually I have a I have to I have a question for you. This is like an ethical question. Okay. <laughs> an ethics question? You said? Mildly, mildly ethical. Yeah. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> there was a test in the package, in the same package. So I don't feel... Okay, so basically the idea is like there was a bug that only occurred on Windows. That's someone, a Windows user, pointed out to me like way back when. So I fixed it, and then I put a test in the test suite for that bug. And, and, the, and it's irrelevant on any other platform, but on Windows, it would like do something really bad actually <laughs> statistically or just no it would like, like it would like crash r basically <laughs> yeah okay yeah and i don't think it was anything that i did i think there was some weird i don't know i could never figure out like why but mm-hmm. um so i put a test in there and it and it was and it just a, and it was fine for like many years um but then for some reason it like on window and i don't use windows so like i can't observe this a lot it for some reason it started crashing again on windows is it is the more is is this leading to so you remove the test? What, what, what? <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Go on. Then. Well, before I have one more thing to say, but what? So, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> before we go on. Oh, I I mean, there's just part of me that's like, yeah, seems reasonable. I would probably do that. Yeah. <laughs> At some point, it's just like. Uh, use it your own risk. <laughs> it's open source, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're being very responsible for adding the test, so you can like be a little bit less responsible. I feel like I spent that's my okay. bonus points on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, I, that's okay. my only defense really is that I think the only way you could trigger this bug was to call like an internal C function directly. Mm-hmm. Like, so not mm. call. So basically, there's no reason to ever call the function in this manner. Um, yeah. But if you did call it directly in this, like calling by using like the dot call function. Yeah. Oh God. Then it would like trigger this bug, and I and I think actually I think that in the interim, like the, the R core like made it so that you can't actually call like you aren't supposed to call functions in that way. Um, so I didn't feel that bad about getting rid of the test because I feel like you shouldn't be doing this anyway. Right. So yeah. Could you add, like, a warning? I, yeah, that would be a... Yeah, probably. I think if you had a warning, that is, like, fine. Okay. Like, yeah, like, just to be like, hey, don't do that. This is wrong. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I do feel bad. Back... Although they would know, right, because their session would crash. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So, like, I feel like I don't like the idea that there's something about my package that makes R crash, like, in general. Um, but I'm not sure. I wasn't sure. Like, I couldn't... For, like I need to like I'd have to fire up like a Windows you know session and yeah I mean I feel like it's I don't think it's unethical to be balancing ROI versus client experience you know what I okay. mean okay like so I don't think that's like unethical but it is I mean I bet the CRAN people wouldn't be happy like you're like oh this test is failing so I removed it and now this passes 
Do you think they listen to our podcast? I don't. I know <laughs> someone's gonna write it. No, I feel fairly confident they do not. But yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that is funny though. Yeah, I don't know. I, that's the thing. It's like if you're in a business, this wouldn't even be an ethics question. It would just be like a business question. Yeah, like a yeah, like an ROI question, and that's like totally fine. So yeah, and like. But, I mean, it is true that, like, there's a slight chance that someone... But they'll figure it out pretty quickly, right? Because they'll do it once and it'll crash their session. I just... Yeah, I just think that, like, that... I, first of all, if this were, like, like a user-facing kind of function, then that would be a big problem, obviously. Um, but, like, you, like, I think most people wouldn't even know how to, how to like, invoke the series of calls that, would, that creates this bug, you know? Like I feel like, especially nowadays, like maybe back in the day when people were futzing around in the internals of R more, um, but now like a casual user of this package will never encounter this bug because like you they wouldn't even know how to call the function in that way. Yeah. And so I just feel like the probability. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially it's like a risk calculation, right? I think like the probability exactly. of someone triggering this bug on Windows only is like is pretty low. Yeah. I mean, maybe the best thing, maybe the thing that makes this ethical is can you, like, dig up that email and write back to that person and be like, I've reintroduced this bug. <laughs> like, <laughs> in case you're still doing it. <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, that's like a GitHub issue. It's like, come back 12 years later and be like, FYI, we unsolved this. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Deal with it. Like, <laughs> Now you're making me wonder, like, when that was. 2003. Because it's, it's not clear to me that I would even have that email. Because it would have been, like, before <laughs> I started using Gmail. Yeah. Oh, man. To me, that's totally fair game. I think you're fine. Well, okay. It wasn't that long. It looks like it was in 2012, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's in the window of, like, you could write back. Yeah, that person probably was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but you would get all your brownie points plus more back. Because, like, their reaction wouldn't be like, why are you emailing? That's like, why are you bugging me? They'd be like, wow, that is a responsible maintainer. Kudos. He cares. Like, he, he wrote back. All right. You know what? Now you got me thinking. I don't, Why don't you do it? I cut, like, send us an update. Like... <laughs> This is like, you know, those like morning shows where they like, we're going to call, like this person doesn't know. I was, I was in a car, I like never listened to those, but I was in an Uber where I heard it, where they, and I, I'm sure these were, I, I feel like I was, I was thinking about this. I was like, those had to be actors where it was like, they were calling, they're like, we're like a flower company. You want a bouquet? Who do you want to like send it to? And he like sends it to his coworker and then his girlfriend's on the phone she's like you jerk you know? um and like it's like like we our equivalent of that it's like you're gonna call him right now and we're gonna hear his reaction to like his bug report thing i would be interested oh i found the email <laughs> well now okay i have to <laughs> you don't have to do it live but just like update us yeah yeah too bad i can't just call him right now yeah Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's next time. All right. That's, that'll be our new thing. <laughs> this person was a PhD candidate in 2012. I'm guessing they have a PhD at this point. Yeah, that would have been like my my age. Well, not age, but like your my... class, roughly. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of things that you um, told me that kept me up at night. <laughs> I don't know. How's that for a segue? I know. I was like, wait, is this one going to keep you up at night? No. <laughs> no. Um, anyway, yes, tell You me. said something last time that kind of like made me think a little bit. Oh. Been, it, you were... <laughs> That's unusual. No. <laughs> Go on. You met, well, you made reference to some, I can't, I can't remember, some, like someone who made a post about how like artificial intelligence takes away all the fun. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fred Bennett. Right, right. Uh, it was a Kickstarter? Yeah. And like uh, that, like I, it kind of passed me by as we were talking. Like many things do when we talk. <laughs> um, but then, like I started to think about it. I'm like, yeah, that's um, that's a big thing. It's it's huge. It it made me think that like so like if you think of like 
there's like a normal distribution of stuff that happens in any given process, right? And you have like your extremes on the left and the right, right? Then AI kind of takes out the middle, right? Well, no, does it? I, th- I was thinking it takes out the extremes. No, I thought the whole point of that idea oh i know okay i see what you're meaning not like ex- yes yeah like they take out the, the middle, routine stuff like yeah the routine yes. yeah and so like human beings have to intervene on the extreme stuff right either yes, ex- right. And whatever positive or negative means in your context like the extreme negative or the extreme positive right yeah yeah i guess i'm thinking about it as like several like in the very kind of cartoonish it's like the the graphs you see for t tests there's like two normal distributions there's like failure state distribution and there's like acceptance state distribution and you just need to be looking at where the tails overlap i didn't follow that wait what <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's like i i guess like it's not the what is your normal distribution of? it's like i guess what i'm saying is that there's two distributions there's the distributions of like things that are clearly like the the dis, there's the distributions of things that pass your test right okay and so like if you assume there's like truth there then there's the distribution of right things and then there's the distribution of wrong things okay and those should be those are two different distributions got it but the problem is that those curves overlap right in the tails of each distribution okay does that make sense? I, yes, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so so you're looking at extremely things that are right that look like very close to wrong, and then things that are wrong that look very close to right. I see. oh okay yes. So that's why I was like, well, no, you were saying yeah that okay. I, I guess I vi- I visualized it a little bit differently. Okay, but I I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean that this is so pedantic. <laughs> it's like, well, what's your distribution of? Well, like, I guess the what got me thinking was like what like a like so like what is the so the distrib yeah like i guess what we're both converging on is like what is the what are the characteristics of the process that human beings see Mm -hmm. right because it's like it's a process of extremes in some sense right Mm -hmm. and so it's not like you could take the mean of that you know like it's not like a pro it's not like a distribution that is easily summarizable well i mean that's kind of the point right if it were easy to summarize you could just give it to a computer right I feel like, um, and it's and it's a prediction problem. It's not like an observation problem, right? It's yeah. That's what I feel like. That's what makes it hard because if you just had two pools of things, then you could pretty easily be like, okay, here's the cutoff, and we know the properties of like we're going to get this many false positives, this many false negatives. But if it's like a prediction process. You have to, like, assume it's the same data generating function, you mm-hmm. know, and it might not be. So you're kind of, like, also assessing that at the same time or I don't yeah. know. Like it, Th- this yeah. problem, I'm guessing there's, like, stuff on this. But uh, I just feel like as, like, a human, like, the human experience, like, suppose you're, like, looking at, like, there's an algorithm that filters images, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, and then you're a human reviewer that gets mm-hmm. the ones that are kicked out by the algorithm, right? Like, how would you characterize that subset, right? The subset that the human being sees. Uh, and, like, and also, like, can you translate that characterization into, like, what the human experience is, you know? Because it's, like, they're just, it's just, like, a, it's, ca- it's got to be, like, a weird subset of pictures, right? Yeah, like, the, the like, corgi butts that look like loaves of bread or whatever. I, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that is how it would... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's like <laughs> there's like all those like deep learning examples. Yeah, right? yeah. those are popular a few years yeah, ago. Like, it's mu- like are, muffins is this or a dogs. chocolate chip muffin yeah, right. or that yeah, chihuahua face? Like <laughs> so cute. Anyway, that's that's all. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting to think about. Like, is it? Is it? I mean, I yeah. I feel like my frequentist side's coming out, where it's just like. Okay, you see me have two populations, truth and not truth, like, or like, yeah, H0 and H1, right? Right, yeah. I, yeah, and, uh, like, each of those have characteristics, but it's almost like, yeah, could there be, like, a, a third distribution that's just, like, weird stuff? <laughs> well, that's the, isn't that the distribution of the things that the human reviewer sees? 
Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like you take the two tails, you make that a little distribution. But that's the thing. You in in like a very frequent to simplified world, you wouldn't act like that's a distribution. It's like it's like a mixed model. Yeah, like a, well, it, it it's like yeah. weirdly truncated, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. It's like this set of odd things, right. and and you've like you've like set your standards for like where do you cut off those two curves, right? To look at like the stuff that's overlapping. Yeah, but but I think I like we you think of it in terms of like an algorithm development, right? And so, but in your mind, you see the whole picture, right? Like you see the whole distribution, yeah. and all you see both distributions, right? And where they overlap. But like the person who has to like only review the those cases, they don't see the whole picture, right? Oh yeah, exactly. And it's like honestly, for morale, it's almost like you should sprinkle in stuffs from the middle of the distribution just to right. like, keep people. That's what got me thinking. It's like cause so, like that per- the person who gets to has to review these like cases, their mean is in a super weird place. Oh, for right? sure. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think that was the point of the article. Right. Like, exactly. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. So like their expectation. Like, if their expectation is not, like, what your expectation is, because you see the whole thing, right? And so your expectation mm-hmm. is, like, where the actual, like, mean of the null distribution is or whatever, right? Uh, but, like, their expectation is in a super weird place. And so, like, their sense of, like, what is weird and what is not weird is totally different from, like, what your sense is, right, as you're developing the algorithm, right? <laughs> it's like... Yeah, and, like, I think... I think about this a lot with the alpha data because it's, like, okay, what's what's fun and like hopefully what's happening is i mean this is sort of intuitive but you can imagine that like we don't need data on like jeans and a sweater and booties as an outfit right like people that's like so easy (laughs) and people just know what that looks like like it our model is like good at predicting that right um what we need data on are like really extreme weird outfits uh and because like but in fashion, this is almost, like, super easy because it's, like, well, and then the people who are fashion experts are, like, interested in that stuff. And so we need them to generate that data, and they want to generate that data versus in, like, the Kickstarter example, like, the fun part is seeing interesting normal things, you know? Like, like they're not assessing is this project – weird or not they're assessing should this go live on our site or not and that has to do more with like the quality of the project and and so it's like they'll miss like cool things that are clearly cool (laughs) but that's like what's fun about the job yeah 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 so but i still think about that because like there's also a fair amount of like qa work we have to do about like is our model producing valid outfits, yes or no? Or, like, you know, going through a little more rote, like, do these things go together, yes or no? And, like, things like that. And um, for that, it's a little bit more, like, I, I do think about this, about, like, who's going to do what work and how do we make sure that everyone's still having fun? And, like, you know, like, I was I was grateful for that article because it helped me articulate it a little better. But then I'm also I feel like I just work on such an like easy problem sometimes. Not easy. It's a difficult problem, but like it's like smaller data and it's easier to think about what's fun for people. You know, it's not like you know the horrible examples from Facebook. Of yeah, like, yeah. Is this child porn or not? You know, <laughs> like yeah. So it's it's a different situation, but yeah. It's it's true. It's. <laughs> I have no answers there. I just had thoughts. Yeah. No, I know. I know. I have so many good ideas that come out so quickly that sometimes we have to like retread them. Mr. You, know? you do have so many good ideas. <laughs> like, yeah, all my thoughts about my sitting posture. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I realize that is kind of what I like about the the podcast I keep mentioning this Josh Marshall podcast is that he similarly just like clearly thinks a lot about like little minutia from time to time right <laughs> like but then we'll like talk about it or blog about it and I'm like this is my person right. like <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about the Hillary Parker job requirement what's oh the like someone posted a job description that mentioned that yeah. opinionated and out. Yeah, that was cool. So yeah, someone posted a job description that mentioned the opinionated analysis development right. like paper slash preprint thing I have. And um 
that was yeah it's well that was kind of my hope of how this work would go that it's like it's just kind of saying like approach this work in a principled way and I think this job listing was saying like approach this work in a principled way you know so I was I was happy that someone was able to use that as a quick way of expressing that in a paper yeah. or in a yeah. job posting. Yeah, I just yeah I just I've never seen like a citation in a job posting. <laughs> this is so this is a job posting for the Financial Times apparently. Oh cool! Oh wow! I didn't realize that because yeah I for a, a senior data scientist at the Financial Times. Wow. And it says, cool. what you will be responsible for, and one bullet point, is applying statistical techniques to our web, subscription, and content data in order to answer interesting questions. Research into user behavior helps us improve our models. We try to make sure this work is repeatable and accurate. For more on this, see Hillary Parker's paper on opinionated analysis development. That's, yeah, that's very gratifying. <laughs> I, I was very happy to see You know that. what? That's going to be the source for your Twitter blue check, st- blue check I think. I know. I think they paused. Those. Did they really? Not that I've, yeah. Not Darn. That I've, my brother actually keeps me updated on that. On the, on the... Cause he, he's a journalist, so like he actually should have it, yeah. you know? And, uh, but I think he thought, like, this is dumb. This is all ego. And then later he's like, I want it. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, no. I am a little bit like, come on, why is this difficult for me? You know, this is sexism. No, just kidding. <laughs> Jack's got lots of problems now these days, though. So, what's that? I said Jack's got a lot of problems. Oh, Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like getting. Fired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, but no, I'm really grateful. Like, it, yeah, that's like very gratifying to see. I, I mean, it's just not. It's nice to know your like things are getting used. Yeah, totally. And, like. And so, I mean, I just, the biggest thing is, like, it is, like, very validating to know that our podcast, like, is, like, generating real world stuff. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's, that's like, the most gratifying thing about this podcast, for sure. It's is not like, all just talk. And we, this is kind of what our keynote was about. But, like, this is, like, this has value. And it's nice to see that manifest in traditional ways, right. you know, because you kind of have to you kind of have to have that leap of faith most of the time because people aren't necessarily going to report back like, oh, I use this in this way. Um, but we kind of had at first like the intuition that would be true. And then now we've gotten more like empirical evidence for it and, you know, people's direct feedback and then things like this are just like, yeah, like super great <laughs> yeah super great ways of getting that empirical evidence and so yeah that's pretty cool yeah. yeah i thought that was nice well and, and again like i still believe that approaching analysis in this way we just didn't have like ways of articulating it and we kind of still don't like like it, and so i was thinking about that recently because i was like wow I, I did write that like a while back I think I wrote in like 2016 2017 ish and and so it's like it yeah like I don't know that we've made a ton of progress since then yeah it just seems like the fruit is still pretty low hanging <laughs> yeah exactly you know? and like it it just it is important and it it becomes more important because even since then more people are doing data analysis versus package development but it still feels like most of the people who are sort of evangelizing, publishing, you know, standards are still kind of more programmers than they are analysis developers. Right. Yeah. If you will. Uh, so I kind of, I think I just like, you know, we kind of like intellectually moved on from that to the kind of like design thinking narrative stuff, but I still think the other part's really important and I still see it all the time. Like I, it's, you know, most of the people in my department are machine learning engineer kind of mindset. And so I even ran into that recently cause like I could tell someone was kind of giving me attitude about how I structured data in a table and like, I structured it in like a tidy way. Like, I mean, you can imagine an outfit is like a collection of IDs. The IDs were like correspond to the items in the outfit. Uh-huh. Um, and I put it in like a long format where it's like one line per item. And then 
you know, there's an outfit ID and you like group by the outfit ID. And like people were like, oh, well, I was expecting like a JSON blob <laughs> of like the outfit, you know, like kind of like a lit, like a one line per outfit with a list. And I was like, aren't you just going to like explode that JSON? Like I, I just did a step for you. Like it, I get it. But I was also like, Ugh, everyone here is so like, you know, production oriented versus analysis oriented. So right, yeah. like, yeah. And like, I don't know. I, I was a little irritated. I mean, not this, <laughs> I don't have, I, I had empathy for that use case and I was like expanded, you know, my, I was able to take my ego out of it <laughs> and not feel defensive, but I obviously felt a little defensive because I was like, no, I'm like following principles here. Like I didn't just do this because I'm like, oh, Hillary just stuff weird. Like <laughs> I was like, I just had like a different end use and like, and it wasn't even a weird end use. The end use is literally like building an outfit prediction model where like, yeah, having this formatted in a long way makes like the training data easier to construct like yeah done anyway whatever (laughs) well you know i guess this is somewhat related is that you know every time we talk about this is also a follow-up from the last episode where every time we talk about like programming and data analysis and uh and like writing functions to do your data analysis uh, I'm always reminded that we're like the worst data analysis, data analysts in the world. <laughs> I know, I know. And what I think is funny is that like literally nobody comes to our defense. <laughs> <laughs> and like I, I'm completely undeterred by that. Oh no, I'm me just, too. Like, you guys just I, don't know. I, I, <laughs> I feel great. Like I, I have no problem whatsoever. Uh, but I just think it's... I don't. I don't think other people don't know. Like I think other people are saying the right things for a different context. <laughs> right. Like, I, yeah, that's what's weird about it. I'm just like, yeah, no, we have a different. Like I agree with you for everything you're talking about. <laughs> like that's that's just not what I'm talking. No, about. we're the we're the worst. Well, we're doing the tail thing, I guess, right? Yes. You were the one who said that, yeah. Where it's like, oh, the only things that hit. I shouldn't. I like maybe you're you're more senior than me, right? Where you're like a PI. Well, like, uh, well I don't know. But like it, I mean, you know, whatever. But like, I, it is true that like on top of the fact that I'm like I've worked in this field for like six years, therefore I'm senior. It's also like I work on weird problems even within the context of like this company you know so it's like not even seniority it's like oh but also i think it's like in your kind of organization like you have different you have more roles uh right so like you have you have people who like do a lot of the other things i think yeah like most people on my even my sub team that i'm on are doing like normal mature machine learning pipeline stuff it's just that i happen to be working on these problems for like brand new products and like data collection for brand new products right. like yeah. and like right now i'm really excited because like the thing we were talking about before like some of the stuff is like maturing and other people who are a little more production oriented are like we need this and i'm like let me show you my prototype and then I am super happy for you to solve this problem right. like, in your own way. <laughs> yeah, like I, my goal was to create stuff that wouldn't one day day be too much technical debt. Like that was it. Like I was not trying to like build the platform for like generating and starting metadata. Like so, yeah. And I think um, that is well, that's different from a lot of people, right? I think because like you have a team and there's many different roles and. Um, and the, and the job responsibilities are divided amongst all these different people, right? It's like, I think, um, first of all, you need a sizable organization to have that kind of structural. And then second of all, well, there's no second of all, there's just, <laughs> you just need a sizable organization and most data analytic, I think a lot of data analytic, um, place organizations are small, I guess. And so, and what's my point here? My point is, so for me, it's like, it's, I think in like academia, like seniority results in like you kind of not doing more routine analyses um but for you it's like there's a combination of seniority and also just like the size of like the team that you work on i think you know yeah if i were in a smaller org or if i didn't have the confidence that like this would mature to the level that like real like people who are more engineering focused like take over then i would feel more compelled to like create more mature pipelines but because i knew that there's like 
120 plus data scientists, many of whom are data engineers, you know, like I was like, okay, those people will come in one yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have to like bake it nearly as much as I would have in other contexts. So, and I mean, again, I did approach it really. Ju so this is like essentially starting outfits and then what we're calling outfit images making sure that they get into our game style shuffle. Like there's like a, it's like a complicated data structure and I wanted to make sure I like conceptually mapped it out really thoroughly and then stored all the metadata necessary to like, you know, capture all those concepts accurately. Um, and so it was just like, okay, I had to do that kind of once <laughs> and like, you know, maybe repeat it four or five times total. But, um, Again, like my goal was just to make sure there was no tech debt because I was like, and I've been actively trying to figure out places to like park this work where it's like, okay, can we put it in our digital uh, digital asset manager? Like, should we build something on our own side? I'm not sure, but like whenever that happens, I want to make sure I'm like passing them a very clean set of things where they can like backfill previous work appropriately. And that's been where we've had a lot of pain points is when things aren't backfillable, you know? What, what do you mean um, by that? Like, you know, we, like taking, so like we have all of these, we call them style variants. It's like the IDs for like items. Um, like, a, I mean, it's just like, oh yeah, like a green sweater, like, and there's a bunch of sizes, there's like specific items. And so the style variant ID is just like the green sweater, essentially. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then there's like a style ID that's like, oh, like, the sweater in any color. Right, right, right. right. Um, but like the style variant ID roughly translates to one photo because it's like, okay, you need a photo of the green sweater, but you don't need a photo of it in every size or whatever. And so, um, but in the past, like, you know, storing the photos, making sure that like the biggest thing was just like, oh, if someone from our marketing team, like, you know, makes a little outfit out of a bunch of samples, you know, like takes a physical photo of them or if there's like a model wearing them, they weren't necessarily like porting those IDs over to that image. Um, and like that makes sense from their context because like, they don't need it, you know, um, but we obviously wanted it. So like a lot of that wasn't backfillable. Like now everyone's like tracking that stuff, but they just weren't several years ago. And I've been like kind of backfilling that data. But my goal is that anything I did, you wouldn't have to backfill, you know? Yeah. Like you, you wouldn't have to, or I shouldn't, I'm using backfill in different ways, but like basically the way right now I'm dealing with the fact that there is like a bunch of imagery where it wasn't clear what's in it is to like essentially like manually go through like tens of thousands of photos and like see if they're accurate or not um versus i wanted to make sure that if we ported it over we didn't have to do that kind of like drudge work and it would just all all the data would be there right. you know yeah but so it's like data is recoverable it's just like is the juice worth worth the squeeze at some point um but i certainly didn't want i didn't want anything to be lost like i was like let me just like everything i can think of like you know ids for the actual pixels of the image and ids for you know it's just like figuring out what ids to yeah. have uh, i just want all of those to exist somewhere so well anyway. look, can i run an idea yeah. by you if sure, you still have the time yeah uh i i think it's related to your kind of opinionated analysis development kind of stuff um but so i because i was thinking about like how I think many data, I, I put this poll out on Twitter. I don't know if you saw about like how many data analysts do you work with? Oh yeah. I saw that, but I'm just, I'm only on Twitter now for the, for like the drama. So I just like passed that one. You're right like by. that one looks way too sensible. Yeah. So yeah. Like that one's not about the world burning right. down. So <laughs> <laughs> that anyway, would, that would on. explain yeah. the uh, response rate, right? It's uh, very, very <laughs> low. Um, <laughs> but you know, so my suspicion is that the mode would be at zero, right? I think, and uh, mm -hmm. and it was. It was like forty Me too. forty nine yeah. percent people said they work with nobody basically. Um, and then and then there was like another mode at three. So basically, it's like people who work with nobody, and then people who work on like sizable teams. I think. Interesting. Um, yeah. not, it was not three. It was three or more. Three people on one analysis. It was three or more. Yeah. Well, it wasn't no, no wow. one analysis. It was like how many? I asked like how many people do you kind of regularly work with? Uh, I guess how would you answer that question? 
It just, I, I, do you mean on an analysis or on like projects? Uh, on a project, I guess. Yeah. Who are on a project? Definitely three or more data, data, and data analysis type people. So not like other people, right? Oh, I would actually, you know, no, I mean, almost always it's either I'm the sole analyst on a project. So like other people, I kind of report out and reporting out to other data scientists is like one of the groups I report out to. And sometimes my manager will like, you know, want to dig into details or whatever. But um, recently I have been trying to tag team with someone, although honestly she's doing like more of it. Like it's it's less tag teaming than I originally thought it would okay. be because <laughs> she's just like doing okay. all of it, um, <laughs> which is awesome. But like, yeah, so there was a, there is like a scenario I'm in right now, but the, it's mostly just related to like, there's a ton of work. And so trying to like, you know, divide and conquer. Um, so it's actually not typical or ideal. Um, like where I would say like, like we were talking about like, should she pass this analysis to me? Basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that would be like a scenario where it was one, but we didn't even do it. So it's like, <laughs> uh, does that yeah, make no, sense? Is that answering? No, it yeah. makes sense. I, I, I realize it's not like the easiest question to answer, but, um, I, I I guess what what I, what I, one thing I was comparing it to is like I feel like with say like software engineers right, um, it to to me like it feels like there's more kind of direct teamwork, uh, in terms of like sharing code like and then like and and I feel like a lot of the tooling that they use is oriented especially things like Git or version control systems is oriented around like people working together on similar things, right, and and like like small teams or even medium to large size teams working together on similar things, right? And um, and I, I part of me felt like with data analysis, it's 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 less like that and more like the data analyst has to know how to translate or hand off things to other people, uh, more so than like direct communication with someone who's kind of just like you. And uh, and I like when just hearing you say like, well, you know, you're gonna take this and like hand it off in some sense to the data the, to like the engineers or something like that right or you might take something that you do and like translate it into like a non-technical uh, to like a non-technical person um and I, I so like anyway i just feel like it's a very different kind of collaboration than say like we're going to work on this thing and kind of like file pull requests to each other mm -hmm. yeah and i would say that that i've like honestly never done that where it's like oh Hillary is doing a histogram and Roger is like, you know, doing some modeling and then we're going to PR <laughs> like a shared analysis. Like our paper, even papers seems like they're never written that way. It's like someone delegates right. like part of the analysis. Well, yeah. They, all of the analysis. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. Like, I feel like that doesn't happen nearly as often as like two software engineering, mm -hmm. two software engineers kind of like, you know, sending pull requests to each other.